Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first lecture of APUSH, chapters one and two, the collision of cultures and transplantations. Okay, a couple things before we get started here. Um, the highlights are always in the beginning of the slideshow, covers what we're going to address in the chapters. Um, and just a friendly reminder, again, the, uh, the, the purpose of the lectures here is to give you enough information to help you make sense of the lectures. Um, if you don't get it, then we'll have opportunities to talk about it, so don't, don't beat yourself up over it. Uh, but again, this is kind of a preview to make uh, help you make sense of the readings as you go through it. Uh, secondly, the AP exam only covers, only 5% of it covers uh, the time period before 1607. So in particular, chapter one is not super important for those purposes. I mean, it's important, it's good to know, but uh, for in terms of preparing for the AP exam, it's uh, not the most important part. Okay, so the uh, peoples of the pre-contact Americas, uh, they go over the ice bridge, um, 5,000, 8,000 BCE. People came over the ice bridge, uh, looking, probably following game. Um, came over here, had tools, maps, hooks, probably some other groups there. Again, uh, not terribly important for our purposes here in this class. Okay, a map of the ice bridge, if you didn't learn this earlier in elementary school, I think you probably have, uh, that formed in the Bering Strait, crossed over settled down here in uh, what we know as the United States. Okay, so the growth of civilizations um, in the South, and I think the important takeaway here is that they were complex societies, okay? So the Incans in Peru, uh, the Mayans and the uh, Aztecs, what's later known as the Aztecs, okay? Um, so that they were complex societies, what makes them complex societies? Uh, they had written languages, they had number system, accurate calendars, trade routes, uh, schools, um, an organized military, a medical system. And so, you know, sometimes, well, it's been what your preconceived notion is that um, all Native American societies were kind of simple. Um, this is evidence that it was not that case. Okay, so the uh, peoples that came across and they settled in different parts, um, Again, here's some of the map, and what, what's important, part of the important takeaway here is that depending on where they settled, in part dictated uh, the type of society that they had, and in particular their economy and how they supported them. Okay, so you have civilizations of the north, further north. Uh, again, the ones that I just mentioned were typically in the south or Central America. Um, hunting, gathering, fishing societies, again, depending on where they're at. Uh, a lot of tribal cultures, some uh, have mastered agriculture. And in many of the societies, you have gender roles, and so the typical gender roles where women are caring for the children, um, men doing the doing the hunting and gathering. Evidence of the complexities of the North American Native American tribes. Okay, um, we're going to pivot over towards Europe, and so Europe at this point is recovering from the uh, from the Black Death. Okay, and once you get to the development, if we skip down to the third bullet point, actually, the uh, centralized nation states. And so you have the emergence of monarchies, um, national court systems, armies, uh, a system of taxation. And so along with that, you have this uh, this reawakening of commerce, like uh, this desire to trade, not that the societies have recovered. And uh, you should have learned this in world history, but the shortcuts, so the part of the motivation for the European exploration is the three Gs, God, glory, gold. Okay, so that's what motivated them to, uh, to proceed with their exploration. Okay, and so then we get Christopher Columbus, uh, his first voyage, um, partly religious motivations in terms of uh, converting, uh, quote unquote, savages uh, into uh, Christians. Um, and you know, well, you should know that Christopher Columbus wasn't the first to actually hit the, the New World. Um, but he is the one that triggered a wave of exploration, so that's what he's known for. Okay, so with the Spanish, uh, you have conquistadors uh, come over, they conquer the Aztecs, um, brutally wipe out their civilization. Uh, some unintended, you know, with the disease, they weren't aware of that, but that's what happened. Um, and for, this, for the Spanish America, and this is towards the west and southwest, uh, what you get is the development of these encomiendas. And again, this should be somewhat review from your world history class in ninth grade. Um, so, and they they enslaved the Native Americans to look for uh, to look for gold, and uh, essentially you have a very few Spanish coming over, uh, controlling uh, a larger Native American population. Okay, 
Church America. Um, so the Northern Outposts, uh, you have St. Augustine, one of the, I think the earliest one in Florida. You have Santa Fe down there, New Mexico region. And so the, again, the encomienda system was, was pretty brutal. And so the Spanish state, and this is part of the, your understanding, of the state, uh, they sent over um, mostly men. They would, didn't send over families. There was no intent to settle the new world. It was more really to extract the wealth from it. Okay, and so part of the pushback that they get is the Pueblo Revolt in 1680. Um, the Pueblo Revolt had limited their religious rituals and there was droughts um, and they revolted. Okay, and so it it spelled the end of the encomienda system. Okay, it didn't totally free them, but uh, they they got a little bit more rights. Okay, and what this is going to set up set us up for is this collision of cultures. Okay, so the new world meets. Okay, and so what happens? And this is where if I had a chalkboard, I could, I could draw it out for you, but we don't, so we'll just have to imagine. So the increasing levels of exchange. So this and Again, I can't say this enough, uh, you should have learned this in world history. Uh, so Columbian exchange. So what comes to the, what comes to the new world, to the Americas, um, is horses, livestock, um, weapons. Okay, what, what goes from the new world back to the old world is um, plants, so corn, potatoes, tomatoes, diseases, okay, gold, uh, some crops like uh, tobacco later. And so that that's part of the um, the Columbian exchange. Yes. Yeah, so the democratic the demographic catastrophe is the decimation of the Native American population that weren't used to the diseases in Europe. Okay. So uh, one of the things when you talk about complex racial hierarchy, in particular with the Spanish, uh, because there was mostly just Spanish men that came over, there was a lot of intermixing of the races, and so you have this racial hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is the, the pure Spanish blood. On the bottom of the hierarchy is the Native American blood and in between is whatever level of uh, mixture. Um, more than likely though, it was, I mean, because you can't really tell exactly like what percentage someone is, it was really probably more based on wealth. Okay, and so what happens is you get the arrival of the English and just kind of backstory, there's really three groups. It's the Spanish, the French, and the English, okay? And so for the English, this enclosure movement where they where they kick people off the land. Okay, they turned uh, raising sheep because that's a lot easier and more profitable at this time. Um, they kick people off the land. And there's this movement towards mercantilism and this belief in mercantilism. Again, from world history, mercantilism is this idea that uh, if you have a favorable balance of trade, your country will be wealthier and that all countries should seek to have a favorable balance of trade. Um, to do that, to help facilitate that, you need colonies okay so colonies will provide the uh the resources the raw goods take them back to the mother country they get processed there turn into finished goods and then you sell them back to the colonies okay and so for some of the english because not all the english are the same uh, you get this doctrine of predestination okay calvinism and <clears throat> doctrine of predestination is <clears throat> excuse me that uh that uh you, it's been already decided whether you're damned or saved. And you're wondering to yourself, well, if it's already decided, like, how should I act? You're supposed to act like, you, like you're like you saved because if you act like you're damned, then uh, everybody would know that you're damned. Okay, so that's Calvinism. Uh, that will play an important role on the, uh, the Puritans. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that Brinkley does, Brinkley's the author of the textbook, he talks about Puritan separatists, which we later will know as pilgrims. Okay, so there's really two groups here. Um, the separatists, the separatists uh, want to separate from the church, the Church of England, uh, part of the English Reformation, the Church of England. And so there's no way to there's no way to improve on the church. You just want to leave. While the the Puritans feel like you can purify the church. Okay, they're not so down with all the rituals in the church. Uh, too many rituals, less focus on God, and they want to try to purify the church. So those are the two main waves that come in the north. Okay, and so meanwhile, down in the south, uh, the first uh, major settlement is Jamestown. Okay, there's Roanoke where those people disappear and nobody knows what happened to them. Uh, there's Jamestown here. The problem with Jamestown is that it, um, they come to the new world and it's a bunch of gentlemen. 
and gentlemen and their servants. And what that means is that these people think you're just going to step off the boat and kind of trip over all the gold that's to be found there. So they really have no practical skills. Uh, they have no farming skills. Uh, they don't intend to work because they're gentlemen. And so there's this starving town. And what makes it worse is that they come, or they settle in Jamestown, the swampy area. So there's a lot of mosquitoes, a lot of disease. Um, and so the seasoning period is like if you survive the first, uh, I think it's six months to 18 months, uh, you're going to make it. But of course, if you didn't survive, you're dead. So you die of dysentery, you die of malaria um, because of the, uh, the mosquitoes from the water. And so you have to make it through the seasoning period. So that's in the south. And so really the English settlement is a tale of two. It's going to be a tale of really three. There's the northern colonies, there's the southern colonies, and the middle colonies. Okay, and what really saves uh, Jamestown is they come across tobacco. And so tobacco is this, uh, what the king calls this noxious weed, but it is very profitable. It's easy to grow because you don't, you only need to partially clear the land, easy to grow, and um, it becomes very, very popular in England. Um, so that's kind of saves them. <clears throat> of course, uh, to grow tobacco, to grow tobacco, you, you need workers. And so we're, their first source of workers, well, their first, they probably tried to enslave the Native Americans. Native Americans are tough to enslave up there because uh, they know the area, they can easily escape. And so they turn to indentured servitude. Indentured servants, so they will bring you over from England. Uh, you sign a contract anywhere from five to seven years. Uh, you have limited rights. Okay, so you're not a slave. You have limited rights um, after five to seven years. Uh, you get some tools, you might go get a little land, and that's their labor source, okay? But the problem is that uh, farming tobacco is really, really difficult, okay? Um, really difficult, nobody really likes to do it. It's backbreaking work out in the sun. So, um, and what happens, there's, a, there's an uptick in the economy in England, and so they get fewer people that want to come over and work as indentured servants. It's not worth it. So again, there's a need for labor because tobacco is still profitable. Um, and so that's when they turn to slavery. Okay, uh, enslave, they enslave African-Americans. Okay, so it's, it's not a natural choice per se, probably more an economic choice in the beginning, but then it needs to be justified in other ways. Okay, and one of the things, um, this, will, this is, uh, will become more apparent as we go through the colonial days. Um, the, the conflict in the colonies, it is, I mean, there's a black and white conflict with uh, slaves trying to escape and then the creation of slave codes and things like that. But it's really more of a rich-poor uh, conflict. And rich-poor conflict can be summed up in the more of a, like an east-west conflict. And so the wealthy folks are the ones that settle first. They have the land that's closest to the water. They're more successful if you are a newly freed indentured servant or someone that's surviving um, after the first wave, to find land, you have to go inland. And so the further you go inland, more than likely you're going to encounter Native Americans and more than likely it's going to be harder living. Um, and so the poor people tend to live on the west side of the settlement, uh, of the colonies. The wealthier folks tend to live towards the eastern part of the colonies. Okay, and that's an important concept to keep in mind. Okay, and why does this matter? Um, because one of the first descents you have uh, in Virginia is... Uh, Bacon's Rebellion, Nathaniel Bacon. Nathaniel Bacon was a, a poor farmer. Um, as he's moving west, he encounters Native Americans, and he wants the help of Governor Barkley uh, to help subdue the Native Americans. And so uh, Governor Barkley doesn't want to risk his men, or I mean men or money, to help uh, this Nathaniel Bacon guy. So Bacon rounds up his supporters, uh, poor whites, blacks, and they march to the capital, Jamestown, and they burn it down. Okay, and Governor Barkley escapes. English troops come and subdue the rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon actually dies of dysentery. But that's the first sign of, well, one of the first signs of, of that conflict in the, in the colonies again. It is uh, rich versus poor. So Nathaniel Bacon being poor and, um, you know, the wealthier parts of the colonies not wanting to help him. And the other thing that's kind of a takeaway from this, and we'll read this in Zen chapter two, is the drawing of the color line. So there's a dangerous combination of poor whites and poor blacks and or slaves that if they recognize they actually have more in common 
uh, with each other than they do with the with the wealthy on the eastern part of the colonies, uh, they will they outnumber them and could overpower them. And so how do you separate the poor whites from the poor blacks? Uh, you give some status to the poor whites. Okay. And so that's one of the lessons learned from Baker's Rebellion. You've got to separate those because there are always more poor people than there are rich people. Okay, uh, we're pivoting now to the northern English colonies, uh, particular Massachusetts. And so in Massachusetts, you have a couple settlements. Again, the, the Plymouth Plantation. So these are the, the pilgrims, we call the pilgrims. Um, and a couple notable things, the pilgrim, again, pilgrims are the separatists. So they're led by William Bradford. They intend to separate from the Church of England. Uh, no intention of coming back. Uh, one of the notable things about the pilgrims that when they came over, they're blown off course from their um, from their original charter. And so they actually land outside their charter, which meant typically uh, or technically they're in a state of nature. OK, so they're not governed by any rules. And that's what one of the early uh, found or not founding documents, but influential documents in American history as the Mayflower Compact. So the Mayflower Compact is a social contract between all the uh, uh, all the pilgrims that were uh, uh, on the Mayflower. And so what that means is that they voluntarily agree to give up some rights uh, in exchange for some security. Okay, and um, you can compare this to typically before this, when you think, again, back to your world history, what gave kings or emperors the the right to rule, it was this divine right. Like somehow God had touched them and commanded them to rule. Uh, now this is a different justification for government where people voluntarily give up some of their rights in exchange for some security. Okay, and then we all know about the, uh, the Thanksgiving scene. <clears throat> okay, the other group that landed in England uh, were the Puritans. And again, the Puritans, their intent was to purify the Church of England. They were going to show people how it's done. Okay, if you skip down here, the, they're going to build a city upon a hill. Okay, and so you get the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, these Puritans are led by John Winthrop on the great first, uh, the first great migration we have in this country. And so... Um, Part of this idea of being saved, uh, how do you know, you know, going back to predestination, how do you know if you're saved or damned? Usually there has to be some signs of grace, you know, some sign that God has uh, saved you. Okay, and for the original travelers on the Great Migration coming across that, the, the idea that they didn't die in the middle of the Atlantic was obviously God favored them. That was their sign of grace. Okay, and their goal here is to build the city upon a hill. They're going to build a model Christian society as a, um, you know, to show the rest of the world, as a beacon to the rest of the world. It's a theocratic society, so it is, again, there to glorify God. And so there's a social hierarchy that they're supposed to understand. Uh, Winthrop gives a speech on the journey over a model of Christian charity. And so at the top is, is God. And then you have, you know, the clergy, and then you have men, then you have women, then you have children. Um, everybody's supposed to follow Okay, you're supposed to know your place. You know, the uh, the people on top are supposed to take care of the people on the, on the bottom, but you're supposed to know your place in society. Okay, so the, the downfall of the Puritan society, or part, well, not the downfall, part of the problem of the Puritan society, and it's such a tight-knit religious community that it doesn't tolerate, um, it doesn't tolerate dissent. Okay, and what that means is if you don't support the church leaders who are also your government leaders, um, then you're not likely to last very long. So one of the first dissenters is Roger Williams. Roger Williams had a couple of complaints against the leadership. Uh, one, he thought the Puritan leaders did not treat the Native Americans very fairly. And secondly, Roger Williams thought the, uh, um, the church leaders should not also be the government leaders. And that here's a phrase that you should know, uh, that the church and state should be separated. Okay, and the Puritan leader said, thank you, Roger, for your ideas, you're gone. So Roger Williams gets kicked out and sent to Rhode Island, uh, where he founds a new colony there. Uh, the second major dissent, uh, dissenter is Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson was a popular midwife in the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and if you remember, the, the Puritans are believers in predestination, right? Some people are saved, some people are damned, um, but everybody's supposed to kind of act like they're saved, so, you know, no one really knows. Anne Hutchinson had this idea of uh, antinomianism. And so if you follow that logic, if you're already saved and there's nothing you can do, or if you're already damned and there's nothing you can do to, to become saved, right? it's already predestined um, what, your, what your fate is. And Hutch said, well, if we're already saved, then why do we have to follow earthly laws? 
Okay, and this concept of antinomianism, that uh, that you don't have to follow earthly laws. And then when the church leaders asked her, like, how do you know this? She said, I talk to God. Okay, which doesn't sound so outrageous if you believe in prayer and things like that. People talk to God all the time. But at that time, that is a blasphemous idea. Because if you can talk to God directly, or if Ann Hutchinson can talk to God directly, why do you need the church leaders? And so that's a dangerous idea because it kind of undermines their authority. And they said, thank you, Ann Hutchinson, you're gone. So she gets kicked out. Actually, she spent some time in Rhode Island, then I think she goes to New Jersey, and then she gets killed by some Native Americans. Okay. So originally they get along with Native Americans, but it becomes increasingly hostile, um, and there's conflict between the Puritans and Native Americans. So again, thank you for uh, listening here to Chapters 1 and part of Chapters 2. Uh, tune in for Chapters 2 and 3. See you next time.